Welcome to the physics class for March the 10th. Uh, let's start off with the administrative announcements like usual. First thing is uh, the plan for the next little while. Today is the last day that we will be spending on chapter 18. Uh, so if I wanted, I could give you a test next time we met. But I realize that you probably would appreciate a review day first. So uh, yeah, that's what we'll do. Um, the first time we meet next week will be a review day. What I'll do is I'll go over the answers to the homework that I'm going to give you today. Uh, and then we'll spend the rest of the day just reviewing. Uh, so that, that's next week we're talking about. Um, and also a practice test. I know that you guys appreciate having a practice test. Um, so I will try to get that practice test out to you before Friday night. It's not quite ready to go right now, but I'll try to post it on Canvas by Friday night. So that way, over the weekend, you'll have some time to look it over. And uh, then when we meet next week, the first time, either Monday or Tuesday, depending on whether it's A day or B day, um, we will go over the answers to tonight's homework, and we'll also talk about any problems you have on the practice test. We will not have enough time to go over all of the questions on the practice test. So I definitely recommend that you, you have looked at the practice test prior to next time we meet. Uh, and then the time after that, so either Wednesday or Thursday, depending whether it's A day or B day, um, that will be the real test. Um, so plan accordingly. Remember that whenever we give the real test, that's when I cut off all late homework and all quiz retakes. So if you want to get any late homework in or if you want to retake any quizzes, you got to do it before the day of the test. Otherwise, I do not accept them anymore. Uh, and then also remember that the week after that, the week after we take the test, uh, that will be the end of the term. So that means if you want to do any extra credit, you, that needs to be turned in by the end of the term. Uh, remember that any of the extra credit videos that you see on Canvas, if we have already talked about that subject in class, then it's no longer available for extra credit. And I think I've gone in and I I've identified all of those with a little note saying this one's no longer available for extra credit, but I'm leaving it up here just because you might find it interesting. Um, so I think I've got them all. So anything that you see on Canvas that doesn't have one of those little notes on it is still available for extra credit, including the one about the, uh, the LCD screen on a Kindle or a, uh, or a computer. You know, why, it, why is it the, if you're wearing polarized glasses, uh, depending on the angle, you can't see it. That's one that I uh, originally was going to have you guys do, and then we were going to talk about it. But when I looked at uh, everything that we need to do, I saw we didn't have enough time. So I'm going to leave that one open as being a, an extra credit opportunity you can do. And then lastly, remember that I will give double extra credit to people who create their own videos. Because if you look on the Canvas site where I have the student videos, I don't have very many of them, and I need more. So if you guys can come up with really interesting physics puzzles that you can present via video and then have people solve your puzzles, I'll give you double extra credit if you do that. But remember, talk to me before you go to all the trouble of making the video, because there's been so many times where people haven't talked to me. They just submit a video, and I look at it and I say, meh. You know, whereas if they had talked to me ahead of time, we could have made some little changes here and there, and it could have been a really good video. So if you have an idea for video, talk to me ahead of time. All righty. Well, let's jump into the good stuff now. Let me, uh, oh, I see. Okay, yeah, Calvin, yeah, don't worry about that. That's okay. Oh, and I also I see that somebody just barely joined us. So let me... Let her in. Uh, okay. And so here are the answers to the ones you haven't already looked up in the back of the book. As usual, if you could only see one of these worked through, what one would you want it to be? And I do think we are only going to have one time for one because I'm looking at the list of things we need to talk about today, and it's a pretty long list. So we're only going to be able to do one of them. Which one would you like it to be? I'm not seeing anything typed into the chat box, guys. That's either a very good sign or a bad sign. Okay, number six. All right. Um, 
All right, now I'm, I'm starting to see multiple requests for number six. Um, okay, last chance. Okay, looks like everybody's agreement. Okay, so six is definitely the one we're gonna do then. Uh, all righty, so I, I anticipated that actually. I've got my book already open up to the right page. All right, so problem number six says we've got a light ray that's going from water into a mystery liquid. All right, let me open up a whiteboard and let's draw a picture of this. Okay, so here is the boundary between the two liquids. So this is water and this is the mystery liquid. And so here's the light ray coming like that. Here is the, the normal, because remember, whenever we measure theta, it's always the theta relative to the normal, not the one relative to the, to the surface. Okay, so that's theta one. Now, according to the problem, it says that if you're going from water into this mystery liquid, then it's bent toward the normal. So this, this line right here, that's the normal. So, so if it's bent toward the normal, that means it's bent that way. So what that means is the theta two so, so this is material one with N1, this is material two with N2. So theta two is less than theta one. All right, now, what does that tell you about N2 relative to N1? Does that tell you that N2 is greater or does that tell you that N2 is less than? So I, while we're at it, let, let's have you guys all do it. Um, so tell me, is N2 greater than N1 or is N1, N2 less than N1? If the picture is as we've got shown here. I wanna see something in the, in the chat box and make it be a private message. I'm not seeing any messages, do you guys not know? Oh, okay, all right, so I'm, I'm starting to see, so I see one message, let's see a couple more. Interesting. Most of you are saying that you think N2 is greater. A few of you are saying you're not sure. All right. Okay, well, remember Snell's law. N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2. Okay, so N1 sine theta 1, that's fixed. That is, that is what it is. But N2, if, if we could vary N2, we could, if we could make N2 be whatever it is, we have a little dial we could, we could twist to increase N2 or decrease N2. So if, if, we, if we were to do that, if we make N2 bigger, well, that's not gonna affect the incoming stuff. The incoming stuff is what it is, okay? So, so if we make N2 bigger, then that means the only way that it can stay equal is that sine theta has to get smaller. Okay, uh, so, and, and so the way sine theta works, if theta gets bigger, then sine theta is also gonna get bigger. All right, so if theta gets smaller, that corresponds to N2 being bigger. If it was the other way around, if theta was bigger, the only way that could work is if N2 is smaller. Okay, so, so it is in fact true that N2 has to be bigger than N1 if, this is the picture where the, the theta is smaller. So what does this tell us? This, this tells us that the refractive index for our mystery liquid must be greater than the refractive index for water. And if we look in the book where they have that table there, we find out the refractive index of water is 1.33. So we don't know for sure what our mystery liquid's refractive index is, but we do know it's greater than 1.33. All right, now, uh, if you keep reading the problem, they say, okay, so now what we're gonna do is we're going to uh, have it so that it, when, it, when it enters the liquid coming from crown glass, so N1 now is not water anymore, N1 now is something called crown glass, and N2 is still our mystery liquid. So what they're saying this time is when, when it comes in here, at angle theta one. They're saying that when it goes into the mystery liquid, this time it's bent away from the normal. So what that means is this. So it means that theta two is now greater than theta one was. So that means it's now the opposite of what it was before. So that means that N two must be less than 
whatever n of crown glass was. Okay, so now we've got it narrowed down. Now we know that the, the refractive index for our mystery liquid, okay, we know that it has to be greater than the refractive inde index of water, and we know that it has to be less than the refractive index of glass. All right, and so water is 1.33, and glass is 1.5 something. Now, remember, there's different types of glasses. So it uh, looks like 1.52 must be, must be the refractive index of crown glass. So this is the refractive index of crown glass, this is the refractive index of water. So the refractive index for our mystery liquid must be somewhere in between. Does that make sense? Everybody good with that? Okay. All right. Uh, so the other the other questions, uh, I really don't want to take the time now because otherwise we're going to run out of time for the new stuff. If you have any questions about last night's homework, uh, then hold them till the end of class. And after we've talked about all the new stuff, I'll be glad to talk about it. These. Okay. So today we are going to finish up chapter 18. Uh, when we were talking last time, I showed you this picture right here. And you may remember that what I was talking about at the time was I had just finished talking about what happens if you send light through a sheet of glass, like a glass window, where, so this is the glass in here. And um, what we said was that if it's, if it's flat on both sides, with both sides being parallel to each other, if you have a light ray coming in here, then, so it gets refracted and then it comes out, so the, re, the light ray that's coming out is parallel to the light ray that's going in. Now it may be shifted a little bit, okay? So it's shifted uh, to the left there a little bit, uh, but it's parallel. But that's only gonna be the case if it's a sheet of window glass. It's only gonna be the case if the left side is flat and also the right side is flat and the two of them are parallel to each other. Um, and in fact, What's really fun and interesting is what happens when the uh, when the left side is not flat, and uh, and now it doesn't have to have be both. I mean, what you could do is you could have a you could have something that looks like this, where the left side is curved, okay, or you could have something like this where only the right side is curved, or if you if you really want the best results, it turns out is the best results are if you curve both sides. So if that's the case, then, then the incoming ray is no longer parallel to the outgoing ray. What's going to happen is you're going to bend them. And if you're clever about how you shape the glass, you can make it so that all of the rays that are coming in from a really distant object, so like, like say the sun, you know, the sun is infinitely far away. So if you look at all the light rays that are coming in from the sun, all of those light rays are parallel to each other. Okay, so you got all these light rays here. So if you choose the right shape for your lens here, you can get it so that all of those, all of those light rays will come to, to, together at a point here. And if you had put, a, put a piece of paper at that point, you, you can start fires if your magnifying glass is big enough. Now, what is the best shape to accomplish this? Most people think that if you make this be a part of a circle, Okay, so imagine we've got a really big circle here where like here's the, the center of our circle. And so it's every point on here is equidistant from that circle. And so if we do it in the vertical direction and we also do it in the horizontal direction, then we would have what's called a spherical lens. And so most people think that the ideal shape for the lens here is spherical. Turns out that's actually not the case. A spherical lens will be pretty good with the spherical lens, the, all these light rays will, will kind of sort of come together at a place that's kind of sort of close, but they won't come exactly to the same point if it's spherical. If you want them to be exactly at the same point, this needs to be a non-spherical lens, which we'll talk about later. Um, okay, so, so for right now, let's just say that it is some shape that we, let's say that we paid a lot of money for a really good microscope, or I'm sorry, really, really good magnifying glass. 
and the uh, shape of the lens here is exactly the right shape. So everything comes together to a, to a focus right there. So what we're going to do is we're going to define the, the distance from the lens to this place where they all come together to focus, which by the way is called the focal point. Okay, we're gonna call that the focal distance. Now the focal distance is going to vary depending on what the curvature of this lens is. If this lens is really highly curved, what's gonna happen is the focal point is gonna be really close to the lens. If it's not so highly curved, then the focal point is gonna be further back. And in fact, if it's, if it's not curved at all, then there really is no focal point, which is kind of the same thing as if you take the focal point and you move it off to infinity. That's kind of, kind of the same point here. All right, so depending on how, how sharply curved your, uh, your lens is, your focal point might be close to the lens or it might be far apart. So let's just call this distance F, all right? So now, uh, hopefully you guys realize, you may have seen that there are other ways that we could make lenses. We don't have to make the lens so it looks like this. We could make the lens so it looked like this if we wanted to. I'm sure you guys have seen things like that. So this is the normal lens that most people are familiar with. This is the kind of lens that you see in a magnifying glass. This is called a concave, nope, sorry. This is called a convex lens. This one over here where it's thicker on the edges and thinner on the middle, this one is called a concave lens. And the way that I like to think about it is, imagine that you're standing here next to a cliff. So here's a big cliff and it's raining. So you wanna get out of the rain. So what, you want, what do you want? You want a cave, right? You want something that's shaped like this so that you can duck in here to get away from the rain. So when you, when you see a cliff with a, you know, kind of a opening like that, that would be a cave. And that is exactly what we have here. Imagine this is the edge of the cliff. You know, the opening is like this. So if we go inside, we could hide from the rain. Okay, so this is a concave lens. And then the other one is a convex. All right, now the convex lens, you can see there's the focal point right there. So here's the light rays coming in. They're all coming in parallel to each other. They come to a focus. So if I were to want to measure the focal distance of this lens, there it is, that would be the focal distance. What about a concave lens? Does it even have a focal point? Um, well, it certainly doesn't look like it has a focal point because when we see, here come all these light rays coming in here, you'll see that because of the shape of the lens, they get bent away from the middle. So these light rays do not ever come together. So this, does not have a real focal point. Now, why do you suppose I said real? Well, because it might not have a real focal point, but if you were a person and you were standing over here and you looked at this, and so you looked at the top ray and you see it's coming up like this. And then you move your head down a little bit and you see this one, you move your head down a little bit. Okay, so you don't, you don't know what's on the other side of this lens, but you could easily be forgiven for thinking that all of these light rays came together from a point back here. So if I, if I take this, uh, let, me, uh, let me erase it. So if I take this ray right here, if I trace it back and I take this ray right here and I trace it back in a straight line because the person who's standing over here, they don't know for sure what's happening on the other, end, other side of the lens. They're just gonna assume that it's all, it's, it just continues. So if I trace all these back, I'm gonna have a point right here where it looks like the light rays are coming from that point. Um, now, did the light rays actually come from that point? No, they didn't. The light rays actually came in like this and then went out, came in like that, went out, 
came in like that one. So they did not actually come from this point, but they behave as if they had come from this point. Okay, so even though it's not really a focus point, it, be, it behaves virtually the same. And so we're going to say that this is a virtual focus point or a virtual, virtual focal point. Sometimes you'll hear it called a focus point. Sometimes you're, you'll hear it called a focal point. The same thing either way. Okay, so a concave lens does not have a real focal point, but there is a point that behaves virtually the same. And so we call it a virtual focal point. And it's not over on this side of the lens where you would expect it to be. It's on the same side of the lens where the light is coming from. So keep that in mind. Okay, so now that we know that, what happens if you have an object that is not the sun? It's not infinitely far away. Let's say that, you know, there's a tree outside your window here. And, and you were to look at that tree under or through a lens. What would that look like? Well, okay, so here is the way we do this. Uh, so I'm going to teach you a, a way of analyzing this. And this is called ray tracing. So I trust that you guys are going to take careful notes here. So what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to trace the light rays. This is the object that we are interested in uh, finding out what happens. And so this is the tree outside my window. Now we're going to treat it as if this object was glowing. And so imagine, imagine that it's nighttime and I've got a magical tree that glows in the dark. And so I'm interested in the in this point right here at the top of the tree. And if it's glowing, that means that it's putting out light in all different directions. So there's an infinite number of light rays all coming out, going an infinite number of directions. I'm going to pick two of those light rays, and I'm going to give them a special name. I'm going to call them the principal rays. There's something special about these two light rays that are going to make it so it's easier for me to figure out what's going on. Okay, so the first ray that I'm going to choose is this one right here. I'm going to call it principal ray number one. And the reason that I selected this light ray is because it is traveling parallel to this line that you see right here. This line that travels through the middle of the lens and is perpendicular to the lens that has a special name. That's called the optical axis. Okay. All right. So the thing that makes ray number one special compared to all of those other rays that are all emanating from, from the object is ray number one is parallel to the optical axis. Now, why is that important? Well, because Remember what happened before when we had light rays that were parallel to the optical axis? Let's go back up here. So remember what's happening here? All these, oops, okay. All these light rays that you see that are coming in parallel to the optical axis, they all get focused to a point right here. So, so if I pick principal ray number one to be the ray that's parallel to the optical axis, what that means is when it comes out the other side of the lens, it will go through the focal point, okay? Uh, now, other rays will not. Only ray number one will. It will go through the focal point, All right? So I'm going to draw that. Now, if I have a piece of paper there, it's going gonna, it's gonna to stop when it gets there. But I don't have a piece of paper there. So it comes here, and it goes through here. Now, one thing I need to explain. When we're doing this analysis, we're actually cheating a little bit. This, What's happening here? is not, I'm showing it as if there's only one place where the light gets bent. And hopefully you guys realize that that's not really what's happening. There's really some refraction taking place at the front surface. And there's really some more reflection taking place at the second surface. But if we assume that it is a thin lens, where I say thin compared to all these other distances here, then then what we can do is we can make a simplifying assumption and we can treat it as if all of the refraction takes place just at this one point here. Just it makes the analysis a lot easier. Okay, so ray number one, 
parallel the optical axis. When it comes out the other side, it goes through the focal point. Ray number two, okay, the thing that makes it special is that it goes through this point right here, which is the exact same distance f. Okay, so the focal point on the right side is the distance f. And then this point over here is that same distance, it's just on the left side. So every lens, you can draw two dots, one on the right side, one on the left side. If you draw that dot so that it's exactly the focal length away from the lens, then you can, you can treat it like, so there's a focal point on both sides. And so ray number two, I selected it because it goes through this focal point. And what that means is when it hits the lens and comes out the other side, the other side, it's gonna be going parallel to the optical axis. Because what's happening here is a principle called reversibility. And it would help if I could spell reversibility right. Let's try again. So reversibility, okay. Lenses have this neat property of reversibility. If I take a light ray that's traveling from right to left, okay, it's going to come out the other side exactly the same as if it had come in that side and gone out this side. So what you can do is you can take any light ray that you want to. Uh, so this, this light ray, ray number one here, it could go through like this and come out like that, or you could put it this way. So you, you can put arrowheads on both sides of those. So this ray goes in like this and comes out like that. Well, it behaves the same way as if it had come in like that and gone out like that. That's the principle of reversibility. All right, so that's why I chose these two rays. Ray number one comes like that. Ray number two goes through the focus point, which means when it comes out the other side, it's going parallel. Look what happens where these two rays come together. That tells me where the image is going to be. And then what do I mean when I say image? Well, what I mean is, so imagine, remember we got this glowing tree outside my window. So if I were to take a, a, a lens and hold up the lens here, and if I put a piece of paper right at this point right here, what I will see, I will see the, the glowing tree on the paper because every, this point right here, all of the light rays will come to a nice focus right here. And it's not just the principal rays. Any ray, so if a ray comes in here, so it's not one of the principal rays, it will go through that same point. And the ray that comes out here, it will go through that same point. Any ray that leaves the head of the tree here will come to a focus, uh, they will all go through there. And then the same thing, the ones that leave from the middle point here, they will all focus at the middle point here. The ones that leave from the base here, they will all focus at the base here. So all I need to do is just trace the two principal rays and that will tell me where all the other rays are gonna to come together as well. Now, if I want to see a nice sharply focused image, I have to put the piece of paper right here. If I mess up, if I put that piece of paper a little bit too close, you can see the light rays do not come to a, together there. And so what I'll see is, you know, I'll see something on my paper, but it won't, it'll be fuzzy it'll be out of focus. If I want it to be in focus, it has to be right here, okay? Now, most of your homework tonight is going to involve being able to calculate where the image is going to be, where the object is going to be, and where the focus point is going to be. And in fact, there's an equation which I'm going to just give you, I, I'm going to commit a sin. And, and I'm not kidding when I say sin. I mean, you guys know that I think it's really important for physicists to always derive the equations that they use. And so if I give you a, an equation without deriving it for you, then I am committing a sin and I just, and I feel terrible about it. But when I look at all the stuff we need to do today, I see we just don't have time to derive it. Now in your book, they derive it, but also I think it's good to see it. So when you look in Canvas for tonight's homework, you're gonna see that on that same page where I tell you what tonight's homework is, I've also posted a YouTube video that does a really good job of, of 
of uh, deriving this equation. So that's how I'm going to soothe my conscience here. So I'm just going to give you the equation, which is something I do not normally do. All right. So here is the magic equation that you need to know. 1 over f equals 1 over do plus 1 over di. Okay, so f we've already talked about. f is the distance from the lens to the focus point. Now, in theory, if you know what the curvature of the lens is, it's possible in theory to use that information to calculate what the focal length is. But in fact, in practice, that turns out to be really difficult. And that's way beyond the scope of what I, what I would do in a high school physics class. So what we're going to do in this class is we're always just going to say, if, if you need to know the focal length of a lens, just uh, hold it up to go outside where on a sunny day and do this little test right, right here and just measure measure what is the distance from the lens to where the sun's rays come together. And so we'll, what we'll do is we'll just experimentally measure what the focal point is for any lenses that we're going to use in our class. Okay. Um, so in your homework tonight, uh, so we're going to be using this, equa this equation. And let me go back to here. Okay. So F stands for the focal distance. DO stands for the distance from the lens to where the object is. O stands for object. So DO is the distance from the lens to the object. DI is the distance from the lens to the image. All right, so that should be pretty straightforward. Hang on a sec. Somebody just dropped out and then got back in again. So it looks like somebody's having some internet problems here. Okay. All right, so uh, if you, if you can do basic algebra, which I know all of you can, tonight's homework is going to be really easy. So what you can see is we got F, we got DO, and we got DI. Uh, so if I give you any two of these, you should be able to calculate the other one. So let's look at the example that I have on the screen right now. Uh, so I'm telling you that the object distance is 30 centimeters. So that means the object is 30 centimeters away from the lens. And I'm telling you that I did some experiments. So I took a piece of paper and I put this piece of paper in various places. And I found out when the piece of paper was here, the, object, the image was really fuzzy. And when I moved it back here, the image was really fuzzy. But when I moved it to this point right here, then I got a really nice, sharp, well-focused image. And so experimentally, what I've done is I've determined that the image distance is 15 centimeters. So I want you to tell me what is the focal length of that lens. Now, looking at the picture, you can tell that clearly, you know, I mean, just, just looking at the picture, it's obvious that the focal distance is less than the image distance. So we know right off the bat that F is less than DI, but that's not good enough. I want, an, I want a number. So here's what I want you guys to do. Get out your calculators. So we know what DI is. We know what DO is. What is F? Everybody get out your calculators. And when, I want you to type the answer into the chat box in a private message. I don't want anybody else to see. So make it be a private message. What do you get? OK, I'm seeing one answer. I need to see more. Do you guys not have calculators? You should bring a calculator to class every day. You can use your phone if you want. Come on, I'm only seeing one answer, guys. OK, now, OK, there we go. All right, now I'm starting to see more answers. Okay, now interesting. So what I'm seeing are two answers. Some of you are saying that F equals 10. Others of you are saying that F equals 0.1. Now, you're not giving me the units. So, uh, so here, here is where units become really important. 
those of you that, that are saying that F is equal to 0.1, I hope the way you meant was 0.1 meters because that is in fact the correct answer. Those of you that said F was equal to 10, I hope the way you meant was F equals 10 centimeters because it turns out that is the same. 10 centimeters is equal to 0.1 meters, okay? So as long as that was what you meant, then good, okay? Now this brings up a question. Uh, when you do the homework, should you, should you write your answers in meters or should you answer, write your answers in centimeters? Up until now, I've always said that the safest thing to do is always work with standard physics units. Uh, and so meters is the standard physics units. So, so I mean, you're, you're always safest if you work with standard physics units. But here's a case where as long as the units of F are the same as the units of DO and DI, then you can just go ahead and use the numbers that are given here. And the number that you get for F will be the same unit as these, okay? But if, you, if, if you're ever in doubt, I mean, the, the safest thing to do is always convert them into standard physics units. But in this case, you can, it's okay if you're a little bit lazy. All right, so we found that the uh, focal distance is 10 centimeters, which looks about right. I mean, if this distance here is 15, this distance there, 10, yeah. Yeah, that looks about right to me, okay? So, uh, so this, this equation here, one over F, equals one over DO plus one over DI. Okay, so memorize that equation. You are gonna be using that equation a lot. Tell you what, let's look at a couple other examples here. Let's look at this case right here. Okay. Um, now in this case, we don't have numbers to look at, but something interesting is happening. The object distance which is, okay, this object distance DO is twice the focal length. That's a special case. Something really interesting happens in that case. What you'll see is that the image works out to be the same size as the object. That was not the case before. When, when we go back, let's go look back here. So the, these other ones that we looked at, let me, let me get rid of all my marks here. So you see, if the object is placed way back here, so he, this is the point that's twice the focal distance. So you can see that the object is further away than that. Notice that the image is smaller than the object. Also, notice that the image is upside down. That's also something that's worth, worth noting. Okay, so as long as the object is greater than 2f away from the lens, it will always be the case that the image will always be smaller than the object and the image will always be upside down. But if the object is in different places, then that will not be the case. That's where, that's where this table that you see right here comes from. Okay, this table right here is pointing out the fact that, okay, so, Assuming we have a convex lens, now you're gonna see the behavior is different for a concave lens. But for right now, let's ignore that. Let's just focus our attention on convex lenses. So if the object is greater than two focal distances away, then what that means is M, which stands for the magnification factor, is that the object will always be smaller and it will always be upside down, okay? And it will also be located uh, in this range. It'll always be located somewhere between the focal distance and twice the focal distance. Okay. If on the other hand, the object is closer to the lens than 2F, so let's say the object is in here, okay, then the image will actually be larger than the object was. Um, and in fact, let's let's go let's take a look at that. I've got I've got a thing here for that. Okay, here we go. All right, so here we have a really interesting case. We have the the object is located really close to the lens. It's closer than the focal distance, in fact. Okay, and so if we do 
this ray trace procedure. Okay, so if we if we pick the two principal rays that I told you about, and we use them to figure out where the object is. Okay, so the first principal ray is the ray that's parallel to the optical axis. When it comes out the other lens, the other side, it has to go through the focal point. The second light ray is the one, or the second ray is the one that it uh, it's going to come out. Now it doesn't it, because the focal length is to the left of it. It can't pass through the focal length, focal point, but it's going to it's going to come. It's I'm going to choose the one that comes out parallel to that because when it comes out the other side, it's gonna be parallel to the optical axis because remember the principle of reversibility. If the light ray came in from the other direction, it would go through the focal point, right? That's the principle of reversibility. All right, so I've got principle ray number one. I've got principle ray number two. Where do these two rays come together? Answer, they don't. These two rays do not ever come together. So there is not going to be a real image. But again, you'll notice I used the word real. There might not be a real image, but if you were the person standing over here and you were looking at these rays and you see a, a ray right here and you see a ray right here, and this is a curtain right here, and you don't know what's on the other side of the curtain, if you trace these guys back, assuming that they traveled in a straight line, now, you don't know that they didn't actually travel in a straight line. You, so, but you assume that they did. They appear to have come from here. And so what's going to happen is we're going to have a virtual image right there. Notice the virtual image is bigger than the object was. And notice that the virtual image is not upside down. I mean, last time, Last time we did it, the image was upside down. Um, and also notice that the virtual image is on the same side of the lens as the object was. Okay, so, so that's what's happening here. So we're saying that if the object distance is, is less than the focal distance, then what you're gonna get is you're gonna get an enlarged image and it will not be a real image. It'll be a, what we call a virtual image. And now this is interesting. What, it, what this means is that if you use the thin film equation or the thin lens equation, so let's say we use one over F equals one over DO plus one over DI. Okay, so let's put in some numbers. Let's suppose that F is 10 centimeters. Let's suppose that DO is eight centimeters. I want everybody to get out your calculators and I want you to do the math and I want you to tell me what you get for DI, okay? And then I want you to type it into the chat box in a private message. So we're gonna take this equation right here. We know what F is, we know what DO is. We don't know what DI is. I want you to put it in your calculators, crunch the numbers and tell me what you get. While you're doing that, I'll do it myself. Okay, so I'm starting to see one number there. The number is not the one that I would have gotten. So, okay. Okay, I've got my answer and, oh, okay, good. All right, so the first couple answers I saw were different from my answer. The last couple answers that I'm seeing are looking good. So uh, Aurora is saying, hey, Mr. Hendricks, there's something fishy going on. My answer here is negative. And so she's saying, how can it be negative? Well, that's what the number does work out to be, right? I mean, those of you that got a negative answer, you didn't do the math wrong. You did the math right. The answer is negative. And the, and the way we do that is we interpret the negative to mean that it's on the, on the other side of the lens, on the opposite side of the lens from where we expected it to be. I mean, pre when we did this before, if we have the object on the left side, we expected the image to be on the right side, okay? And, and, but in this case, it's not where we expected it to be. It's over on the opposite side. So 
That's what it means when, when they say here, see how they say that di works out to be negative in this case, okay? So it means that it's on the, it's on the wrong side of the lens, which in this case means it's on the same side as the object is. So, okay, so whenever you see di being negative, that means it's on the same side of the lens as the object. If you see the di is positive, that means that it's on the opposite side of the lens from the object. Now, what do you do if you have a concave lens? Okay, so let's do a case like that. So here's a concave lens, okay? So in your homework tonight, they're gonna give you problems like that. So you better be prepared for it. So our good old friend here, one over F equals one over DO plus one over DI, okay? We do not have a real image, or I'm sorry, a real focus. Let me, let me take that back. With, with, a con, with a concave lens, you don't have a real focus point. You have a virtual focus point. So what that means is when you're using this equation, if the distance from the lens to the focus point was some number, let's say that it's 10, okay? When you're using this equation, do not put 10 in for F. Put in negative 10 because it's not a real focus point. It's a virtual focus point. So virtual means negative. Okay, so if it's a concave lens, then F and DI are both going to be, uh, they're both gonna be negative. And so when we do the ray trace, so when we do the math, just go ahead and do the math, but just remember that F has to be a negative number. If we do the ray trace, well, okay, so, um, here is the object. And so our first principal ray is the one that's parallel to the optical axis, and it's going to get bent this way. Our second principal ray is the ray that goes through the focus point, but a concave lens does not have a real focus point. Okay. Um, so, so the focus point that it has to go through is going to be the one on the opposite side. Okay. And so that, that means when it comes through here, it goes through here. And then, uh, so when it comes out the other side of the lens, it's going to be parallel to the optical axis. So if you're the person standing over here, and, and here's a curtain, so you don't know what's on the left side of the curtain, but you do see a light right here, and you do see a light right here. If you make the assumption that these guys came from the same point, if you were to trace them back, you would come to the conclusion that these two light rays came from this point right here. Now, you and I know that they didn't actually come from that point. They actually came from here. But the person standing over here, he doesn't know that. So these guys are behaving virtually the same as if they had come from here. And so this is going to be our virtual image. So when we do one over F equals one over DO, that's supposed to be a D, plus one over DI, F is gonna be negative because it's not a real focus, it's a, it's a virtual focus. DI is also going to be negative because it's not a real image, it's a virtual image. And when I say real image and virtual image, I wanna make sure you guys understand what I mean by that. Let's go back to a real image, okay? This is a real image. And the reason I say it's real is because this light ray and this light ray really do come together at that point. If those two light rays really do come together at that point, then this is a real image. But with a concave lens, they don't really come together, okay? With a concave lens, this light ray and this light ray never come together. I mean, what, I mean at, the, at the source they do, but once they leave the source, they never really come together again they just appear to have come from here. So this image is not a real image, it's a virtual image, okay? All right, now there's one thing that we didn't talk about that we I should go back and hit. Um, this, this equation that you see up at the top right here, the magnification equation. This is the equation 
that tells you the size of the object compared to the size of the image. Okay, so HI is the, the height of the image. HO is the height of the object. And they are related by a very, very simple equation here. Okay. HI divided by HO is equal to negative DI over DO. Now, why do you need to have the negative there? Well, because HI, okay, is, well, th this one is, is inverted. So, so uh, the, the negative just tells you that it's, that it's upside down, right? So uh, in this case, DI is 15, so we put in 15. DO is 30, so we put in 30. And so what we get there is 15 over 30 equals 1 half. And we put in the minus there to remind us that it's an upside down 1 half, not a right side up 1 half, right? So the, this is another equation that you're going to be using tonight. This is the, called the magnification equation. And then the other equation that you're going to be using is called the thin lens equation, right? So I have not derived these equations and I feel terrible guilt because of it. I, I hope you guys will forgive me, okay? But uh, if you wanna see them derived, just look at the video. That video that I put on Canvas not only derives the thin lens equation, but it also derives the magnification equation for you too. All right, so I think that you guys will be okay. All right, Gia, that'll be all right. Don't worry about it. Okay, now, this is not the only stuff that you're going to need to know for your homework tonight. You're also going to need to know a few other things. So let's go down in here. Okay. Um, okay, one of the things is how do various optical instruments work? Like, how does a telescope work? Well, a telescope is actually a pretty simple device. You're going to have two lenses. One of the lenses is going to have a long focal length, and the other lens is going to have a short focal length. Okay, so when you do the ray tracing here, um, what you're going to find is, uh, in fact, I think it's easier to work with. It, if, let me open up a, a new whiteboard. Okay. So, I'm going to do a ray trace here of a telescope. So I've got a lens here that has a relatively long focal point. So there's my focal point. I'm going to take another lens here that has a short focal point. Um, actually, tell you what, let's just do them one at a time. Let's, let's just do the one lens first, and then I'll come and I'll do the second lens later. OK, so here's my lens. And here's my optical axis. And here's my focal point, okay? And so here's the object that I am interested in looking at through my telescope. So let's do a ray trace for it. My first principal ray is the one that comes through there and goes like that. My second principal ray is the one that goes through the focus point. So if I got this distance on the right, I got this distance on the left. So it's gonna go through the focus point here. Um, you know what, I think I want him to be further away. Let's make, Let's make him be over here as far away as I can get him. Okay, so my first ray is that. My second ray is this. Okay, so here is the image. So, so this is the image of my first lens. Now, the image of my first lens, I want that to be the object for my second lens. So I'm gonna take my second lens and my second lens has a focal point right here. And notice that this one is a shorter focal distance than the first one. That's really important. If, if, these, if you don't have the second lens with a shorter focal distance than the first lens, then it's not gonna work out. Okay, so what have I got here? I've got an object here that is closer to the lens than the focal point. So if I do the ray tracing here, so I'm going to have a ray, ray like this, and it's going to come out on the other side. Boy, I wish I had more space here. I'm running out of space. So tell you what, let's go, let's go back to the original picture uh, because I, I, I ran out of space. I really need more. 
Okay, so if we go back to this picture here from the book, then now hopefully you can see, so this is the object, this is the image, or I'm sorry, this is the lens. So the object that we wanna take, a, that we wanna look at is way over here. So if I do a ray trace over here, this is gonna be the image that is created by the first lens. This image now becomes the object for the second lens. So what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to take the second lens and we're going to look at this image through this lens. So it's no longer the image. As far as we're concerned, this is now the new object. And so when we do a ray trace for this, what we're going to find is that the, the, this is going to be the, the final image. And it's going to be a virtual image. So the the light rays do not really come from this point. But if you trace these light rays, they appear to come from this point. And so what we have is we have a virtual image that is greatly, re, greatly enlarged compared to the original object. The original object was only this high. Actually, they made their object so it extends on both sides. I wish they wouldn't have done that. People find that confusing. So the original object is only this big. The final image is this big. And notice that the image is also upside down. They don't really, they don't really show that very well. Okay, so that's, that's how you make a telescope. Just take two lenses where one has a long focal length, one has a short focal length, and then put them together like that and bingo, you've got a telescope. Okay. What about a camera? How, how does a camera lens work? Well, Okay, let's go in here and let's look at this. Okay, first off, okay, this, here is what a camera lens looks like. It is a tremendously complicated device. If it's, if it's a good quality expensive camera lens, it is going to have lots of pieces of glass inside there, all acting together as if they were just one lens. Why do we need so many pieces of glass in there? Well, let me tell you, it's because of this. Remember how I said or a few minutes ago, way back at the beginning of the period, I said that if you were to make a lens where the surface of the lens is spherical, okay? So what that means is if I were to continue this all the way around, what I would have is a perfect circle. So this distance equals that distance equals that distance equals that distance equals that distance. So if I do that same thing in the vertical direction and I do it also in the horizontal direction, what I will have is what's called a spherical lens. So if you make a lens where the surface of the lens that's curved is curved spherically, what you'll find is that the light rays do not actually come to a focus at the same point. This is what we want to happen but if, if the lens is spherical, then this is what's actually gonna happen. And so our image is going to be fuzzy. So what we need is we need to make the surface of the lens be not spherical. Okay. Now, back in the old days before they had computers, this making a non-spherical lens, you know, taking a piece of glass and grinding it in such a way that the surface of the lens was not spherical, that was very difficult. In fact, it was basically impossible. Back before we had computer computer uh, controlled grinding equipment, it was impossible to make a lens that would that would did not suffer from this problem, which by the way is up here. So you see the word spherical aberration? Aberration means flaw that causes the image to be blurred. Spherical aberration means the reason your image is blurred is because the surface of your lens is spherical, which is not the ideal shape. So if you want to correct spherical aberration, what you need to do is you need to grind your lens in such a way that the surface of the lens is not spherical. Now that we have computer controlled grinding equipment, it's pretty easy to do now. But back in the day, it was impossible to do. And so, uh, so if you had a camera, 
and you had fuzzy images, you, you had to figure out some way to correct that. Uh, now I'll talk in a minute about how they did it, but this is not the only kind of aberration that you can have. Another type of aberration that you can have is chromatic aberration. And if you did last night's homework and you understood last night's homework, you should be able to understand why chromatic aberration happens. So remember, aberration means some sort of a flaw that causes the image to be blurry. Chroma, the root word of that means color. So one of the reasons why images are fuzzy is because if you take white light and you shine it through a lens, well, you guys remember what we talked about last time? Remember dispersion? Okay. Dispersion means that the, the refractive index of red is not the same as the refractive index of green, which is not the same as the refractive index of blue. The different wavelengths have different refractive indices. What that means is they are gonna to come to a focus at a different point. So if we take white light, which is a combination of all the different colors, if we shine it through a lens, what you're gonna find is that the blue light comes to a focus a little bit closer to the lens, and the red light comes to a focus a little bit further away from the lens, and the other colors are somewhere in between. So if I want to take a picture, if I, if I get out my camera and I want to take a picture of something that's white, I got a problem. Where do I put the, uh, the, the paper? Where, where do I put the film? If, if, if I put the film here, then anything that's in my picture that's blue will be nice and sharp and well-focused. But anything that's red is going to be blurry. So what I could do then is I say, well, all right, so I'll just move my film back to here. Well, now everything that's red is nice and sharp and well-focused, but anything that's blue is gonna be blurry. So the only thing I can do then is I can just kind of compromise, put it right here and split the difference, but I'm going to have a blurry image. Now, how do I compensate for that? Well, what I can do is I can take a, take a convex lens, which has a certain dispersion and combine it together with a concave lens, which is made out of a different type of glass that has a different type of dispersion to it. So you guys remember the different, there's crown glass, there's flint glass, there's quartz, there's you know all these different types of glass that we talked about, right? So if I make these two lenses so they're out of different types of glass, if I'm really clever, I can make it so that the dispersion that occurs in the first lens gets canceled out by the dispersion that occurs in the second lens. Now doing this is extremely difficult. So the optical designers who design lenses, uh, yeah, they, they have a very tough job, but they have all sorts of computers that help them and stuff. But if, if you are careful here, you can make a lens that is called an achromatic lens. And what that means is you've corrected for the chromatic aberration. But you'll notice the only way we could do it is by using more than one piece of glass. So what we have really is two pieces of glass, two lenses, but they are acting together as if they were just one lens. And that is the reason why you see this camera lens here is so very complicated. Because chromatic aberration and spherical aberration are only two of the aberrations that exist. We don't have time today to talk about it, but if you want to be a camera lens, camera designer, you're going to find out that there are actually lots of other types of aberrations. So if you want to make a really good high quality camera, one that you're going to charge people a lot of money for, you know, they, they are going to want really good, crisp, well-focused pictures. And the only way that you can do that is by using a super complicated lens that has lots of different glass elements that are combined together in very clever ways in order to cancel out all the aberrations. Okay, so that's the reason why cameras look the way that they do. Okay, one last thing that we need to talk about is there's another optical instrument that is crucially important to human beings and other animals as well, and that's the eyeball. The eyeball is an optical instrument. Um, so what happens here is this thing right here is the lens and it causes the light rays to come to a focus. 
Now, the back part of the eyeball here, that's like the film in the camera or the digital sensor. I mean, nobody uses film anymore, uh, digital photography, right? So the back part of the eye is where we want the images to come to focus. Now, I'd like you guys to do a little experiment for me here. Um, I'd like you to hold your hand in front of your face, close to your face. I want you to focus on your hand. So your hand is in sharp focus and the stuff in the background, it's all fuzzy, right? Now, without moving your hand, I want you to change your eye. So now you're looking at the stuff in the background. So the stuff in the background is now sharp focus. Notice that your hand is now fuzzy. Okay, so you can focus on your hand or you can focus on the stuff in the background. You cannot focus on both. What is happening inside your eye when you're changing the focus? So you're focusing on the hand or focusing on the background. What's happening inside your eye that changes that allows you to see either your hand sharp focus or the background sharp focus, but not both? Well, the answer is you have muscles right here. And these muscles will push and pull on, the, on, the, on your lens. So it changes the shape of your lens. So when, you're, when your muscles relax, your lens maybe say looks like that. But when, you, when your muscles tense up, then it changes the lens. So now the lens now has a greater curvature. So, so these muscles change the focal length of the lens in your eye and that allows you to focus close up or far away. Now, there are limits to how much you can do. So many, many of you wear glasses. And the reason you wear glasses is because the, the range that you need to change your eye is more than your muscles are capable of doing. Uh, and see, the problem is that your eye, the shape of your lens in your eye is not quite ideal. And so in some cases, what happens is that when you relax your eye, so you're you know, at the normal position, these light rays that are supposed to come to a focus right here, they're coming to a focus here. Others of you have the exact opposite problem. The, the, uh, the shape of your lens here is, is not curved enough. And so what happens is that the light rays come to a focus right here rather than right here. So they come to a focus behind your retina Whereas in this case, they come to a focus before your retina. So you guys have heard the term near, nearsighted and, and farsighted, right? So this is the case that is nearsighted. So in order to correct nearsightedness, you need glasses that look like this, where it's thicker on the edges than it is in the middle. If you have the opposite problem, if you have this problem where we call it farsighted, in order to correct that, you need glasses like this, where it's thicker in the middle than it is on the edges. Okay. Now, some of, some of you have yet a different problem altogether. Do any of you have what's called astigmatism? Is, that, is it a name that you've heard before? If you're, okay, so some of you, some of you have either heard astigmatism or you have astigmatism. Okay, so if you have astigmatism, then you have my condolences because your glasses cost more than other people's eyeglasses do. The reason your glasses cost more money is because you have a more complicated problem. What you're seeing here is astigmatism. So Miriam, okay, I see Miriam has it. Connor says he's heard of it, but Miriam says so that she's not only heard of it, she has it. Okay, so what that means is, if you were to look at the lens in Miriam's eye, and if you were to look at the radius of curvature, what you'll see is the radius of curvature, or hang on a sec, so I can turn on annotation. So the radius of curvature in the vertical direction is different from the radius of curvature in the, tan in the horizontal direction. What that means is, if, if Miriam were to take off her glasses and she were and you were to draw an X on the wall, 
Miriam, Miriam can focus her eyes so that she can see the horizontal part of the X clearly. But if she does that, then the vertical part of the X is going to be out of focus. Or, you know, kind of like what we did with the hand and, and the distance, she can, she can move the muscles so that she can focus on the vertical part if she wants. But if she does that, then the horizontal part is going to be blurry. Because the, the vertical, the, the horizontal rays come to a focus here, the vertical rays come to a focus here, they do not come to a focus at the same point. And so, so she'll either see this or she'll see this, but she won't see both of them in focus at the same time. Now, the way that she has to correct that is she has to wear glasses where the glasses have a different radius of curvature in the vertical direction than they do in the horizontal direction. And it's not easy to do that. So if you are an optometrist and you need to grind the glass lens in order to correct for astigmatism, it's a lot more difficult to do and therefore you're going to charge a lot more money for it. So I apologize on behalf of nature, Miriam, but you just got the raw end of the deal. Your, your eyeglasses cost more than regular ones and that, sorry, but that's just the way it is. It is so sad. Yes, definitely so sad. Uh, okay, well, I think we have covered everything that we need to cover, which is good because we've only got about five minutes left in class. So let's go ahead and look at the homework. So here it is. This is the homework that I want you to do tonight. Now, guys, please, please, please read the book before you do the homework. And work through the sample problems that you see in the book. Those sample problems do a wonderful job of helping you understand stuff. Uh, and then I want you to do these problems, but here's some good news. You only have to do the odd numbered ones, not the even numbered ones. So that should make your life a whole lot easier. So see, I am mean, but I'm not horribly mean, right? Okay. So are there any questions? All right. So if you don't have any questions, you can go ahead and type by in the chat box. And if you did have a question, but you didn't want to ask because you knew the class was being recorded, here, I'll go ahead and turn off the recording so we can talk. <laughs>